Hey, thanks for joining me. In today's video, this is completely unsponsored, we're going to talk portable power stations. So having tested and reviewed well over 30 different portable power stations, I'm often asked to provide advice on which of the many power stations that I've worked with is, quote, the best. And while clearly some power stations are better than others in one or more ways, the reality is that people often have different needs and priorities and budgets. And because of that, it's not really practical for me to give a kind of a one size fits all answer to that question. So what I wanna to try to do in this video is share with you what I think are the most important considerations to be aware of when shopping for a portable power station and hopefully do it in a way that helps you figure out what your particular priorities are uh, and your needs might be so that you can make the most informed purchasing decision based on your needs and priorities, not just mine. Because if you're just starting to look into these types of products and you're anything like I was when I started getting into it, there's a solid chance that you just you know don't yet know what you don't know. I know I certainly didn't, and despite doing what I thought was a pretty reasonable amount of due diligence product research, I still managed to somehow drop about $1,400 on a power station that I can now look back on and understand was definitely not the best purchasing decision that I've ever made. That purchase in particular happened to be the original Jackery Explorer 1000 and a Jackery Solar Saga 100 solar panel. And while those products are decent enough quality and continue to function well, I now know that I paid a fair amount more than I needed to and I got a fair amount less for my money. And so I'm hoping that by the time we're done here, I will have at least helped some of you avoid making a similarly expensive mistake. Okay, so if you've been shopping around at all for portable power stations, you've probably seen some fairly ridiculous marketing going on. There are no shortage of photos in the product listings depicting power stations being used in all kinds of let's say unlikely scenarios like backpackers hiking in the mountains carrying a solar panel in one hand and a 35 pound power station in the other, or maybe tent campers all set up in some mountainous wilderness locale with a couple hundred pounds of stacked power station modules, presumably so they can fire up their electric griddles, food processors, toaster ovens, and whatever other electrical appliances they can think to put in the video or the photo, because you know, who doesn't take their toaster ovens tent camping, right? So let's cut through all the hype Obviously, you don't need a $5,000 power system that weighs 200 pounds to sit by your tent and work on your laptop, and I doubt there's ever been a backpacker who's felt it necessary to hand carry a 35-pound power station through the mountains. That said, these devices actually do provide some excellent real-world utility, and that's really where we should probably start. The first question you need to ask yourself is, you know, what do you want to be able to do with your power station? What kinds of things do you want to be able to run, and for how long do you need to run them? Do you just want to recharge your portable electronics, or maybe you need to power an air conditioner all day long? Uh, for most of us, the answer is somewhere in between those two scenarios, but that still leaves a lot of functionality range there in that middle ground. Now, the best way to know for sure just how much power the things that you want to run will use is to get an inexpensive watt meter like this one. These are less than 20 bucks or right around there, and they're well worth it if you want to be able to accurately estimate your off-grid or mobile power needs. But to try and help you out a bit, I've actually put a link in the video description below to a Google spreadsheet that I'm regularly adding to. And this will show you what the typical power consumption is for a variety of common devices. So in the absence of you know, a watt meter like this one, uh, you can at least get a solid idea of how much inverter power and battery capacity you might wanna be looking for in your power station. And by the way, if you're wanting to run stuff that I have not yet included on this spreadsheet, please let me know in the comments below what those things are and I'll try to add those things as soon as I can get to it. So let's say in my particular case that maybe I only wanna be able to power maybe a, let's say a 12 volt refrigerator uh, for a two day weekend and maybe you know make a couple of cups of coffee each morning, maybe recharge a couple of cell phones overnight and maybe I run a small USB fan overnight. And I don't wanna bother with solar recharging uh, since I'll be trail hopping all day long rather than lounging around at camp all day long. So as you can see here, a typical 12 volt DC fridge freezer will use about 20 watt hours of battery capacity for every hour of use. And that's with the fridge compressor going off and on intermittently to maintain the set points that you have configured. And it only needs about 45 watts when the compressor is actually running uh, with a momentary peak surge when it starts up of somewhere around 200 watts. So now that we know our power station will have to be able to handle a momentary 200 watt surge, which is generally not a big deal. And since we wanna run this fridge freezer all weekend, Let's say that equates to 40 hours of runtime. So I can multiply that 20 watt hours of consumption by 40 hours, which means that I'll need a usable battery capacity of at least 800 watt hours. Now, why did I use the term usable battery capacity? 
So whenever I review a power station, I'll always tell you its rated capacity, and then I'll test to see what its usable capacity is on both the AC and the DC outputs, because quite often the usable capacity is different for the AC versus the DC outputs. And the reason I do this is because nearly every power station on the market posts their theoretical total maximum capacity of its internal battery cells, but in reality, we almost never have access to 100% of that capacity for reasons like AC inverter conversion losses, uh, power reserved for the BMS or battery management systems. You know, we typically expect to only have access to maybe 80 or 85% of that rated capacity. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less, but that's why I always test that for you to let you know what that is. And keep in mind that over the years, that usable battery capacity will actually degrade. And the rate that it degrades will depend on a number of factors that I'll go into in a little bit more detail in a bit. But just be aware that constantly fast charging or fast discharging or using the power station in extreme heat can be significant factors that affect the long-term service life of that power station, along with the battery uh, chemistry that that power station has. But as I said, more about that in a minute. Okay, back to our two-day camping scenario. Let's look at the coffee maker. So, Let's say you'll brew four cups each of the two mornings during our weekend getaway. So you can see that our coffee maker will consume about 75 watt hours of capacity on a single four cup cycle. And that it will also pull about 900 watts while it is running. But it's not gonna be running for very long. So now we know that our power station's AC inverter will need to support at least 900 watts of continuous power draw, and we'll need another 150 watt hours of battery capacity to accommodate our two mornings. Now, for the two cell phones I mentioned, we can see here on the spreadsheet that they will typically consume about 48 watt hours of capacity each for a full charge. So for two cell phones to fully charge on two consecutive nights, I'll need to factor in an additional 192 watt hours of capacity for my power station. And finally, to run our small USB fan overnight for some air circulation, we can see that it will consume about 12 watt hours of capacity for each hour that I use it. So for two nights, it's say, eight hours a night, that's about 16 hours times that 12 watt hours, and that comes out to another 192 watt hours that we'll need to add to that capacity calculation. Okay, so let's add up our capacity needs here. So that's 800 watt hours for the fridge, 150 watt hours for the coffee maker, 192 watt hours for the two cell phones, and another 192 watt hours for our USB fan. So that adds up to 1,334 watt hours of battery capacity. And for good measure, let's just tack on another 10% just to have some extra reserve for whatever. And that's 1,467 watt hours of usable capacity that we would want for this particular scenario. Now, in terms of the AC inverters capacity, uh, so in other words, the maximum power output that we need to have, not battery capacity, we simply add up the continuous watt draw of everything that might need to run at the same time as our highest load. So if this scenario represents my most common use case, I'm gonna be wanting to focus on a power station with an AC inverter capacity of at least 1,000 watts and a rated battery capacity of at least 1,800 watt hours. Uh, and that's because when you account for the typical usable capacity being about 80% of the rated capacity, uh, when we apply that to 1,800 watt hours, that should net us about 1,467 watt hours of usable capacity. And that's basically what we said we were gonna need. All right, so we've narrowed down our choices a fair amount already just based on what we wanna use and how long we wanna use it for. So now let's talk about the next major consideration, battery chemistry. So there are several battery chemistries in play here with uh, portable power stations, but at the time of making this video at least, the two most common chemistries by far are lithium NMC, sometimes called ternary lithium, and lithium iron phosphate, also sometimes referred to as LFP. Now, there are pros and cons to both, but I think most people will agree that the pros column for lithium iron phosphate chemistry is much longer than the pros column for lithium NMC. And by the way, when you look at a power station's specs, if it only says lithium for chemistry or lithium ion, that almost always means it's lithium NMC or ternary lithium, not lithium iron phosphate. Lithium iron phosphate will almost always be listed in the specs as LFP or LIFEPO4. And this is important to know because really the main benefit of lithium NMC is that it has a higher energy density than LIFEPO4, making lithium NMC based power stations uh, noticeably lighter typically and sometimes smaller at the same uh, watt hour capacity as their lithium iron phosphate counterpart. Sometimes though the difference in weight isn't really all that much, kind of just depends on what the components and materials uh, that are being used. So as you can see here in this case, for example, this is um, a Jackery product using lithium NMC. 
it has actually a little bit more capacity than this Blue Eddy EB3A that is using lithium iron phosphate. And yet this is still somehow smaller and a little bit lighter. So that's kind of the, really the main advantage of NMC over uh, lithium iron phosphate. Now that said, there are some very compelling reasons why you might prefer lithium iron phosphate over lithium NMC. Now chief among these would be that on average, the usable service life of a lithium iron phosphate battery cell is somewhere around six times longer than lithium NMC. And the service life uh, is often stated in terms of charge cycles. So in other words, how many times can you fully charge and discharge this thing uh, while it still retains after that 80% uh, of its original capacity? So for NMC-based chemistries, that number is typically 500 to 800 full charge or discharge cycles. And for lithium iron phosphate chemistries, that number is usually more like 3,000 to 4,000 cycles. So big difference, especially if you intend to use your power station on a daily basis. Now, if you happen to be a much more casual user and you only need to use your power station maybe you know, several times a year, then lithium NMC, uh, the limited uh, lifespan of lithium NMC is not probably gonna be as big a deal for you. But that's not the only advantage of lithium iron phosphate over lithium NMC. Lithium iron phosphate battery chemistries in the unlikely event that they ever catastrophically fail for some reason, they are far like, uh, less likely to produce a violent fire. And the materials are far less toxic since they don't contain nickel, manganese, or cobalt. Now that's not to say that lithium iron phosphate batteries cannot catch fire, they, they can under rare circumstances, but they are far more likely to just produce a great deal of smoke instead of a volatile explosive type of fire that can happen with, uh, a, with a catastrophic failure on a lithium NMC chemistry. Now for me personally, this is perhaps the most significant advantage of lithium iron phosphate over NMC, and that's why I'm not really reviewing NMC-based power stations anymore, and also why I've been pretty critical of Jackery's product lineup since up until very recently, all of their products were NMC based. Now, Jackery does have a couple of higher end options using lithium iron phosphate, uh, but the majority of their product line is still lithium NMC. Now, I could make a case for when it might be to your advantage to consider an NMC based power station based on the weight and a somewhat faster cold temp charging advantage, uh, but I still think on balance, the safety concerns significantly outweigh those fairly minor advantages. And for that reason, I do really prefer lithium iron phosphate chemistries for a power station. All right, moving on to the next possibly very significant differentiating feature, and that is maximum solar input. Now, if you don't really ever think that you're gonna bother recharging a power station via solar, and many people don't, uh, then this is kind of a non-issue. It's not a big deal. Uh, but pretty much all power stations will have some capacity to charge via solar. Now, on the other hand, if one of your priorities is the ability to fully charge your power station in one day of good weather, then knowing a power station's maximum solar input should be right up there with selecting the correct capacity and inverter size. Now, a good rule of thumb that I like to use for solar input is to multiply the max solar input watts by five. And then I see if that number is greater than or equal to the battery capacity. It should be if you intend to recharge fully in one day. Because if it's not, it's gonna be difficult, if not impossible, to fully charge that power station on just one day of solar input by itself. So for example, let's say we have a 2000 watt hour capacity power station with a 300 watt solar input max. Now, if I multiply that 300 watts times five, I get 1500 watts. And that means that on an average full day of decent sun conditions with maximum solar input on that power station, I can reasonably expect to get up to about 1500 watt hours capacity charged up in that power station, which in this example is not quite enough to fully charge that power station from zero to 100% in a single day since it's a 2000 watt hour power station. Now, alternatively, let's say that you have a 1000 watt hour power station that can take up to 600 watts of solar input. So again, if we multiply 600 watts times five, that would give us the ability to produce about 3,000 watt hours capacity charge in one full day of sun. And obviously that's a three times more than the 1,000 watt hour capacity. So I'd be able to charge that power station from zero to 100% in just one third of a day of full sun. Or it might allow me to charge it in a full day while also powering some other loads at the same time. And that would be a nice option to have. So generally speaking, um, you want uh, as much solar input as you can get in a power station if you intend to charge it in a full day or less. By the way, if you're finding any of this information helpful at all, please consider hitting that like button for me. I would really appreciate that. Okay, so now that we've talked about the three most significant considerations, at least in my opinion, let's talk about some other things that might or might not be priorities for you. So warranty. 
the average warranty period in the power station product space is about two years. And uh, there are several brands that are now offering a five-year warranty. It's becoming a little bit more common. And usually, um, just be aware that uh, you have to register those products with the company after the purchase to get that five-year warranty in most cases. Um, you'll also usually pay a little bit more for units with a five-year warranty, but depending on your personal concerns about warranty, that may or may not be worth paying a little more for the long warranty, but it, it also might be. Now, I will say that there are a lot of new brands coming onto the market in the past year or two, and if warranty coverage is something that you would prefer to maximize, then I would probably suggest sticking with one of the more established names like Blue Eddy or EcoFlow, or maybe even Jackery. Uh, or Anchor and Ugreen, uh, because there's a very good chance that th those companies are still gonna be around five years from now to honor that warranty. Because let's be honest, if a new brand is just coming onto the market, uh, there are times when those brands don't survive past two or three years. And in that case, what good is a five-year warranty if that brand's not around to support it anymore? Now, a couple of other features that you might want to look for are mobile app control, uh, UPS mode, wireless phone charging. Now, I typically consider these to be kind of nice-to-haves and not necessarily must-have features, and I'll willingly do without those features if the other major features are solid and the pricing is extremely competitive. Pecron really comes to mind here. They don't, as of yet, offer mobile app support, but their units are very rugged, and they offer a lot of bang for the buck. So I don't really care much that they don't offer mobile app support, and the same would go for UPS support. Now, that could be something that's very important to you, and not all power stations do support UPS mode, but many do. So if that is important to you, you should have no trouble finding a solid option in that particular capacity class that you're looking for at a fair price that does have that UPS mode. All right, so getting close to wrapping up here, I also wanna talk about battery capacity expansion options and maybe using a power station as an emergency home backup power source. Not all power stations have capacity expansion options. So if you need that kind of flexibility, uh, or you're thinking that a major use case for you might be emergency home backup power, then I think you definitely want to go with something that does have battery expansion options, something like, like this Pecron here. But do be aware that not all expansion options are created equally. So personally, I prefer if the expansion battery can be charged independent from the main unit and doesn't necessarily require you to always have it connected to the main unit. And even better if it can also provide DC output uh, from the expansion battery uh, while it's disconnected from the main unit. I just like the extra flexibility and the options that those kind of features give you. Now, that said, you do typically pay a little bit more for expansion options that do have those kind of features. And if, and if those features don't really add value for how you wanna use it, then maybe you don't wanna to have to pay extra for them. And there are definitely some solid budget options out there that just give you a lot of capacity expansion without the extra DC ports or the ability to charge independently from the main unit. Now, I will say that while not strictly necessary, if you are thinking that uh, you wanna use your power station for home emergency backup power, or maybe powering your RV with that power station, and if that's a key deliverable for you, a power station that does have an RV30 connector on it is super handy since you can connect it directly to your RV shore power hookup, uh, or you can connect it to a manual transfer switch wired to your home's main breaker panel. Now it's not strictly necessary or a deal breaker though, as I mentioned, because if it doesn't have one, you can still always buy a standard plug adapter to an RV30 connector, but keep in mind that you're still limited uh, by that power station's actual output from the AC inverter, and that could be 15 amps or maybe uh, 20 amps. But regardless, you should probably also keep in mind that not all RV30 outputs on a power stations that have them actually support the full 30 amps. Despite the fact that the connector could handle it, sometimes they actually only support 20 amps uh, because that's just the max supported by the inverter. All right, as a final bonus, uh, I'll just also mention that there are several options out there that do support connecting two power stations together through a special interface, a uh, parallel interface, to get 240 volt split phase AC output by combining those capabilities of the AC inverters. Now, this is definitely not going to be the least expensive option. It's, it's gonna be one of the higher priced options. But if you're looking for a portable or you know maybe a semi-portable option that can handle uh, 240 volt off-grid. Several brands, including Blue Eddy, EcoFlow, uh, Mango Power, for example, they do give you that option if you need it. All right, so hopefully you found some of that information helpful. If you did, please consider hitting that like button for me if you haven't already done it, and I would really appreciate that. And consider subscribing if you're not already a subscriber. I do have a ton of interesting content in the queue coming, including some fun and hopefully useful DIY projects, 
as well as some new products uh, just coming on the market that I think might be worth considering. And uh, I do try to mix it up a bit, so hopefully you'll always find something interesting or helpful in some way. Oh, and uh, we will very soon be trading our house here in the suburbs for a more rural property that will give me the opportunity to expand the kinds of topics that I cover here on the channel. So I'm really excited to be able to bring some new content to you in the very near future. Anyway, I do sincerely thank you for taking the time to join me in this video, and uh, I do hope you'll consider coming back for the next one. Until then, have fun out there.